Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India What we have done so far is to look at the two traditions that dominated Greek thought, the tradition of faith and then the, in the tradition of inquiry and speculation. We have briefly looked at that. What I would like is for you people to look at the sections from Burton Russell's history of western philosophy, which I have asked you to look up. Those sections will tell you a lot more about the speculative and inquiring tradition of the Greeks. We have in the West a tremendous legacy which has come up from the Greeks to the modern days. A lot of this owes itself to the speculative and inquiring tradition of the Greeks. I shall not be today specifically addressing this tradition of the Greeks. I have probably an intention to go back at some time in the future to look at Aristotle in some greater detail, but for the present let us look at some history. It is important to look at what happened in Europe from the time of Greeks. There is a huge interregnum from the time of the Greeks. I am principally having in mind the period of about say 700, no 600 BC to about 400 BC as a very critical time in the history of the Greeks. During this period, there was a rise and then the decline of the Greek civilization. We shall briefly look at this, so that we will know how to look at what happened after the Greeks. Greece as you know consisted of a large number of townships, cities and the political institution of the Greeks consisted of the way these city states were run. There was not much uniformity in the way these states were run. You have perhaps had occasion to study in other courses something about the Greek city states and their politics. Have you? Briefly, okay. you can have a, an idea of the contrast by looking at the contrast between Athens and Sparta. Athens prided itself on its democratic traditions. Sparta, on the other hand, was conservative and very rigid in its ways. Spartans were known oftentimes as great warriors but Spartans were oftentimes not known at all for their intellectual prowess. Whereas, Athenians saw the rise of very many great thinkers and the prevalence of great debates on great many philosophical and speculative issues. Do you know that the Persians invaded Greece and captured a sizable portion of it. Darius, Xerxes, these Persian emperors came all the way across Asia Minor, Asia Minor being the present day uh, uh, confluence of territory starting with Lebanon going to the Bosphorus Straits. They came across 
Asia Minor and captured a sizable part of Greek mainland and a large number of Greek islands. And the Greeks fought them over a 15 year period against two great Persian emperors, Darius and Xerxes. While the Persians had a single cohesive army which came as a huge monolith across the land of Greece, the Greeks were all city states together for the purpose of fighting the Persians and initially Athens became the coordinator or organizer of the federation of cities which decided to fight the Persians. So, the Persian wars were also wars which saw a great transformation in Greek politics and culture. As the wars went on, two things happened. Greek military and political organization became more sophisticated and within the Greek forces, Athens became more and more central till finally, it acquired sole leadership of the federation of Greek states. By the end of the Persian wars, Greek nation or Greek subcontinent or Greek land was virtually ruled by Athens. I probably should not be calling Greece as a subcontinent. It's a, it's a bad habit thinking of India all the time. No, Greece was not as big as a subcontinent. Greece was not even a part of a subcontinent, but still. So, by about middle of the 5th century, Athens is at its prime, the leader of all Greece in not just military might, but economic strength and the very center of the cultural growth of Greek philosophy and Greek culture. This was all made possible because of a great leader called Pericles. The Athenians did not have the tradition of an emperor, but Pericles was almost the emperor of all Greece from Athens, because that was the power of his leadership and the power of the command he wielded over other Greeks. It was during the time of Pericles that Greek civilization rose to its apogee, to its supreme heights. And as Pericles rose in power, there also came increasing tensions between Sparta and Athens, which was led by Pericles. The Spartans were loath to listen to anybody from a superior position and they were very proud warriors. But that aside, increasing tensions between the two led to a protracted war between Sparta and Athens, a very debilitating war in which increasingly Athens became weaker and weaker and weaker. Almost as if a climax to these wars, Pericles himself died 
in a plague which swept all of Athens and decimated the population of Athens. Pericles was one of those who killed in the plague, which was virtually the end of the war and also the end of Athens. And Greece declined after this, slowly but definitely. Slowly, parts of the Greek culture which were located in mainland Italy started growing and one of the places which grew very rapidly as a process of this was Rome. Rome modeled itself politically after places like Athens. Rome was a city state, but the difference was while the Greek city state did not have a very big agricultural hinterland, because Greece was very bad as far as land quality went for agriculture, but Italy had rich tracts where agriculture was possible. So, while Rome was like a city state and while it grew like a city state, it had a big agricultural hinterland and so too had other big growing city states of Italy like Padua, Milan, Naples. Gradually, Rome came to dominate all other Italian states and gradually Rome started conquering territories and terrains outside of Italy. The Roman Empire at its peak went all the way from Great Britain to east of Turkey. It is a big, big territory. Eventually, there came to be two Roman empires. One was, one came to be known as the Byzantine Empire based in Constantinople and another based out of Rome, the Western and Eastern Empire. This took about 300 years, but eventually this was how big it was. Rome eventually declined despite the military might of the Roman army, it is the very growth of the Roman army which led eventually to the decline of Rome. As more and more soldiers for the Roman army got recruited from very diverse civilizations and cultures across the place, across the empire, that army became less and less manageable and more and more prone to inefficiencies. The big extended empire of Rome constituted another basis of the very nemesis of the empire. It became intractable, very difficult to manage, far flung, administering this big territory, gathering the revenues and monitoring law and order across this big territory became more and more expensive and eventually became more and more difficult. So, finally began the crumbling of the Roman Empire. We can say the, the, the apogee of the Roman Empire was about 300 years after Christ and then it started declining. But the growth of the Roman Empire 
produced a very interesting historical outcome, partly directly and partly indirectly. This was the rise of Christianity. We all know that Jesus of Nazareth was a Central Asian Hebrew and was Jewish by faith. It is said that between his third or fifth year till his twenty ninth year, very little is known about him, where he went, what he did and so forth. I have read a fascinating book whose author I do not suddenly recall. Uh, it, is, it is a Dutch theologian, I think, after extensive research, has written a book called Jesus Lived in India, in the Himalayas. Right. It is said that there is, there used to be a, a substantial Hebrew community in Kashmir. It is said that Jesus came to this community when he was young and as he grew, it is said that he came substantially under the influence of Buddhism and he became an expert in Buddhist kind of teaching. From the history of Jesus, from the Christian point of view, little is known till his 29th year. But according to this theologian, Jesus grew up in Kashmir and he grew up in the midst of other Hebrews, Hebrew speaking people, other Jews. <coughs> and he walks again westwards, travels westwards and reaches Israel and then starts what is known as his ministry. He starts preaching things which go directly against the concurrent beliefs of Jews of his time. So, at the same time an increasingly popular young man among the Jews is also felt to be a threat by the Roman governor of Palestine. We know that as a result of these tensions which Jesus stirred came the crucifixion of Jesus and then as the Bible has it his resurrection and his liberation and the birth of Christianity after that. Well, this other book which is about Jesus in Kashmir, Jesus came to in, lived in India. He says Jesus did not die when he was crucified. It quotes very interesting evidence about how several kilos of aloe vera, the juice of which is a vitalizer, were used to wrap Jesus in during that night when he was crucified. And next morning, a very ill, very sick, but still alive Jesus was whisked away by two people out of that terrain, that area and you hear subsequently about Jesus in far off places. But according to this author, this theologian, the Dutch theologian, Jesus did not die young. He lived to be a ripe old age in Kashmir. He preached. He had his own followers. The evidence is in Srinagar, even now, there is a tomb of Isa. <coughs> Srinagar even now has the tomb of Jesus, which is maintained by 
generations of retainers who have looked after that. So, we have different versions at this point, we do not have to worry much about what actually Jesus did, because what is important to us is that after Jesus' time, there were large number of followers of his message. His message was, you do not need a huge priestly class, you do not need people who intervene between you and God. The relationship between man and God is characterized by directness, is, is characterized by is characterized by man's virtuous conduct, which will take him to the Lord. Thus, you have a growing flock of followers of Jesus, the early Christians, who are increasingly hounded, because they are a threat to the prevalent Jewish faith and to the Roman state. Probably the greatest of the teachers of the Christian faith lived in Rome, Rome itself, Paul and Peter. Saint Peter and Saint Paul lived in Rome and were martyred in Rome. And so, there grew around them in Rome one of the largest communities of Christians who for a couple of hundred years went through enormous suffering and harassment in the hands of Roman rulers. The idea of Christian martyrdom was epitomized time and time again by the Christian martyrs who lived in Rome and endlessly suffered, were killed in large numbers, harassed, but did not lose their faith, till finally the Roman emperor himself got converted into the Christian faith and the Roman empire became a Christian empire. Now, this is crucial, because the moment Roman empire became a Christian empire, the most powerful military force and political force in the world became a Christian force. This was also therefore, the rise, the political rise of Christianity in western history. Hmm? As the Roman empire grew, it was also increasingly harassed from the east, from the north and from the northwest by people who are known as barbarians. These barbarians were like tribes, they were from the north as I said, from the east, from the northeast and from the west and northwest. Some of them are very famous, so we can write them, put them down, they were people like Franks. Then you had Goths, then you had Visigoths, then others too. Further east, they developed <coughs> powerful groups like the Magyars and so on. These barbarian forces were continuously harassing the boundaries of Roman Empire, continuously testing its strength, continuously looking for chinks and weaknesses, so that they could break through the frontier defenses of German, I am sorry, frontier defenses of Roman army and break right through into sweeping into Rome. Eventually, this did happen the Roman empire knuckled under and the barbarians swept, swept, swept all across the Roman empire and occupied Rome. 
Now, the capture of Rome by the barbarians led to all kinds of cultural and political transformations of Europe. Look at the differences between the barbarian culture and the Roman culture, barbarian political order and the Roman political order. Roman empire worked under the emperor in an extremely structured bureaucratic form right up to the frontiers of Roman territory highly classified, highly structured and highly codified systems of laws governed the whole Roman empire. It had a well developed judiciary, it had a political administrators, it had governors and then of course, it had an excellent revenue mechanism. In contrast, the barbarian hordes were highly decentralized. They did not function under single emperors were substantially disorganized in the sense that they were autonomous of each other. The Goths for instance were not a single group, there were many groups of Goths who were probably tied together by a single language like Teutonic, likewise the Franks, likewise the Visigoths. So, they were not unified structurally, they were also not under a single command. And it is this difference that drew the attention of the barbarians and urged them for the capture of Rome, because they envied the Romans this magnificent structure, but they did not know what to do themselves. On the other hand, there were some very interesting things in the barbarians too. The barbarians had in them certain practices, which could be early versions, very, very early versions of modern democracy. For instance, the barbarians had a chieftain or chieftains, who were elected by common consensus and these chieftains were held accountable to the groups of leaders in the group. Their decentralized conduct, they see decentralized functioning made them much more cohesive in the in the last days of confrontation between them and the Roman army. The Roman army was more bureaucratic, more tied down by its reason to be accountable across space to different levels of leadership, whereas the barbian, barbarians could move very fast, very rapidly in decentralized groups and organize attacks and more importantly, they could politically stay co cohesive without any big central leadership, central structure of laws and so on and so forth. So, eventually it is this quality of the barbarians that led to their triumph. Sir, yes. Uh, why is he called barbarian? Is there a pejorative kind of Very pejorative, very pejorative because Romans considered themselves civilized and these were considered uncivilized. Barbarians not in a pejorative sense, but barbarians in a historical sense, because they got to be referred as barbarians. But if you look at it in detail, you will see them being referred to as Franks and Goths and Visigoths and Ostrogoths and so forth. Hmm? It is true that in a measure the western world has an unqualified admiration for every aspect of civilization that came from Rome. Western law is mainly Roman law, 
even today. Western systems of bureaucracy very much modeled after Roman bureaucracy. Western systems of judiciary and Western systems of uh, judiciary political accountability very much influenced by Rome and more important the power of Latin to influence all the newly growing languages of Europe was immense. So, you see civilizationally Western Europe tends to look upon itself as children of Rome and it looks upon all those who threaten Rome as Romans did in their own times as barbarians. So, the word barbarian has this history, it has a pejorative history right and in a measure a large number of ex barbarians who are now modern western civilization probably look upon themselves like converts to a good cause, but we are talking about 2000 years ago. So, when barbarians capture Rome they are fascinated by the language, by the culture, by all other evidences of quote unquote civilization and barbarians adopt all of these things. So, that the culture of Rome becomes an admixture ever afterwards, it acquires a lot of good things from the barbarians and it ends up quote unquote civilizing the barbarians. Part of this process is the spread of Christianity all over Europe. a big temptation to go along with this analogy, but then the non western part of today's world are not barbarians by any by any reckoning under development. So, what you are saying is uh, development has come to be accepted as a culture and more importantly a superior culture right and under development is a culture too, but an inferior culture as represented by lower levels of literacy perhaps and poorer health care facilities, Medicare facilities and lack of infrastructure and lack of access to information of all sorts which would make life comfortable. You are saying basically that there is an innate tendency to assume that the economic difference between the west and the non west is not just an economic difference, but bless you, but it also is a cultural difference as defined by the west. 
there is something missionary, there is something, something evangelical about a development expert from the west trying to engineer development in non-western countries. Is this what you are saying? Well, this has been a contention uh, not just in your words, but this has been a contention since the 1970s. It has been said for instance, the whole development language is a form of cultural imperialism, is a form of getting the growing elite of quote unquote non-western countries to accept western mores, western patterns of thinking and in short becoming western themselves and becoming the rulers of their countries by proxy on behalf of the west. This was the argument of cultural imperialism. Well, having clarified this, I can only say this much that it is a tempting way of looking at things. Not, especially because uh, you know the western versus non-western distinction broke down after the 70s. For instance, the coming into economic leadership of Japan and then coming into economic leadership of Southeast Asian, South Asian countries including Korea, they are all non-western, but they are aggressive leaders. So, and then the rise of uh, the oil empire of the Middle East and uh, the Arab world, they are totally non-western, but they acquired the power to determine the rise or fall of western economies by manipulating the prices of oil. So, there have been lots of things happening since the 70s, which makes one question whether this world can be uniformly described as western and non-western. There is a lot which is non-western which has become extremely powerful, not the least of which is the rise of the People's Republic of China. Today, the People's Republic of China is the second largest GDP in the world after the US, it is past Japan. Today, the People's Republic of China holds something like 8 to 900 billion dollars of foreign exchange reserves. Today, the People's Republic of China has thousands of its products exported worldwide. So, what I am trying to argue at this point is that the world today is not substantially western versus non-western. Look at India. India is in some respects an IT leader. India has become increasingly a hub of automobile components. India is becoming increasingly a hub of investment by western companies. So, there are things happening now which do not yield themselves into a parallel to what happened between Rome and the barbarians. Certainly in the 1960s there was this attitude which somewhat resembled the attitude of the Romans towards barbarians. But that was only the 60s, that is 40 years ago. But the point is well taken, except that we should look at the world in its diversity much more than in terms of uniform classifications. Hmm? So, to get back to the spread of Christianity, the growth of increasing interplay between the Roman Empire and the barbarian world led to a rapid proliferation of Christianity across the world of barbarians. And by the 6th century, the church had almost assumed completely its modern form. 
and modern structure centered around room. Initially Christian church leadership did not put much weight on the growth of Christianity which was so obvious in the barbarian territories. They were still thinking as Roman as Rome as their headquarters and the Roman empire as the main force of Christianity. But then the early signs of pressure became bigger signs of pressure. The biggest contradiction within the church increasingly was the duality between in the church itself, in the Christian Christendom itself, duality between Latin and Teutonic. Teutonic is a northern, northern barbarian language and culture. So, increasingly the Teutonic element started dominating over the Latin element within Christendom. By the third or fourth century, this rift became quite significant. And what is more important? This was the basis of what would happen nearly 1200 years later when the big break away from the influence of church in Rome was Teutonic. The big break occurs in the German terrain. Martin Luther starts arguing for Christians to break away from the influence of the church. The part Protestant movement commences in the 16th century. Most important therefore, is to see the connection between the eventual reform of Christianity and the early duality between the Teutonic and Latin versions of Christian culture in early Christendom. But there were two or three other things which developed immensely in the next few centuries in Europe as the Roman Empire broke down. They developed a political order, a political system which covered most of Europe, which was to be ruling Europe for the next thousand years or more. This was the system which came to be known as feudalism. So, feudalism as a political and social system came up with the breakdown of the Roman Empire and the rise of Christianity had a lot to do with the rise of feudal political and social structure across Europe. It is not as if all of Europe had one type of a model of politics called feudalism, no. The feudalism of Poland was very different from the feudalism of the Germanic states. The feudalism of the Germanic states was extremely different from the feudalism of France and Gaul and eventually English feudalism was vastly different from all of these. And across the oceans you had feudalism even in Japan right up to the end of 19th century. So, Japanese feudalism on the face of it looked similar, but was vastly different from all these variations of feudalism and across the big empire of Russia was the power of a wholly different kind of feudalism, Russian feudalism. So, you have the rise of a broad political 
and social structure coming up across Europe, which had formerly lot of similarities across this huge region, but had tremendous regional variations too. So, what we shall do after the break is to look at the rise of feudalism and the growth of church along with feudalism and take it up to the 12th or 13th centuries to the end of what is known as the dark age of Europe. Do you have any questions at this point? All right, let me sum up. What we have seen in this class is that the rise and fall of Greece eventually led to the rise of another great culture and political force substantially influenced by its Greek antecedents namely the Roman empire. The Roman empire rose and spread across the whole of Europe, North Africa and on the one hand you had Roman Empire ex extending right up to Sudan that far down into North Africa and on the other hand going north the Roman Empire conquered all of the German territory to what is today known as the German territory, Germanic territory right up to the Baltic Sea. On the other hand you had the Roman Empire going right east beyond Turkey to the borders of Persia and on the other side in the west it had captured all of the great Brit British Isles. So, this was at its apogee the, the extent and power of the Roman Empire. Along with the Roman Empire grew Christianity especially when there was no need for Christians to be martyred for their cause when the Roman Emperor himself became a Christian then the Roman Empire was a Christian Empire. Then came the practice which was followed for long afterwards. The most influential ruler of Europe who determined the politics of Europe, who determined the, the happenings in Europe also came to be referred to as a holy Roman emperor. For quite a while the holy Roman emperor was based out of France then out of Rome and eventually towards the end of the 19th century or middle of 19th century the end of the Holy Rome, Roman Empire was in Austria in Vienna. So, this was a period of the rise into politics the power of the church Christianity. This was also the period as we saw which heralded the rise of a new political and social order in Europe especially when once the Roman Empire had declined the new social and political order which spread across Europe which had elements of the older barbarian social organization and elements of Roman aristocratic traditions feudalism as a political and social form spread across Europe. As I said feudalism had broad commonalities across Europe, but it was tremendously varied from the end of Siberia which saw Russian feudalism across the huge continent to the British feudalism across in the British Isles you had tremendous variations in the way feudalism worked and operated and transformed itself through time. Along with feudalism as a political and social system grew the church and its institutions and its organizations in incredible power, incredible opulence and most important political dominance of Europe. By the 14th century the, the shared benefits of the church and the feudal leadership across Europe 
was so good, so mutually appreciated that the aristocracy and the feudal lords were the most divinely blessed if the church could so do it. And nothing would be more suitable to the aristocracy and the feudal lords than seeing the church thrive all over the world. There was a symbiotic growth of the two. After the break, we shall look at this and see where it led to. <laughs>